liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waldman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's Friday. Good Friday morning to you. It's not Good Friday yet. That's coming up later. March 15th, the Ides of March. Beware the Ides of March. I don't know. My temptation is to, to say, to speak of them in the plural. Beware them, because there's an S at the end. But I guess it's beware it, the Ides of March. Uh, stay away from the Senate, possibly Rome. Certainly anyone named Brutus today. Bad day for that. Leave your knives at home if you're traveling about. And uh, let's catch up on the news. It is Friday. Ordinarily a day we do solo here anyway. So uh, missing Greg Dworkin. Hoping he's recovering. He's put together a abbreviated pundit roundup for Friday as usual. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll just be borrowing from it to catch up on some of the news. Uh, hmm, look at this. I just, I've got a pop-up ad on my screen today. Uh, I feel bad about this one. What's going on here? Hubert Engineer, Hubert Engineered Woods gets a free commercial today uh, i don't think it's a huge product for our listenership but uh it, it urges you abandon gypsum like, <laughs> all right it's not really a big issue for me i don't think but uh apparently selling uh their own drywall product i gather sound performance and fire resistant strength in uh, what appears to be it's a chemical uh, formula i have to wake up the chemist and ask him it says magnesium Oxide, I don't know. It's MgO, you know, little g. So I think that's probably magnesium and oxygen. And I don't know whether you have to have an O2 or an O17 or whatever it is. I didn't. Uh, I couldn't tell you about chemistry at this point. That was. I think I took that in like tenth grade. So that's a million years ago. I, I don't know. And I don't know any other uh, suffix other than oxide for that. But anyway, it's something else. Uh, abandon the damn gypsum, everybody. I just, I just feel bad for gypsum. I've never had that feeling before, but what a stark command in the, abandon it. I feel bad for you, gypsum. You've been so good to us, but, uh, I don't know. Anyway, just found that interesting, personifying poor gypsum here. But anyway, that's not the news I wanted to tell you. There's much, much, much more. And you should stay tuned to hear it all. Let's take a look at what Greg has for the Pundit Roundup today, because you know how it is in uh, political news. You're supposed to listen to what the pundits tell you is important. And if you don't have the patience for that, we'll tell you what they had to say in shortened form. So uh, today's headline for the abbreviated Pundit Roundup, being in Congress is about more than just getting elected. That's true. There's motions to recommit and uh, various other uh, fun procedures that you're supposed to learn about, but they never do. And, of course, policymaking. That would be, I think, what they're after in this one. Uh, Lauren Boebert is pictured here, so I guess she's the one who doesn't realize that this is the case. And now, of course, she might not even be getting elected again, so that can't help her cause a great deal. Over 100 House Republicans, as we heard yesterday, will skip the GOPs retreat because they hate each other so much, according to one report. And I, I, I just wonder whether it isn't the report we read yesterday. And it isn't. How do you like that? This is CNN reporting that they hate each other, not just Amanda Marcotte observing that in Salon, as we read yesterday. They apparently don't want to spend any more time together than they're contractually obligated to. When he abruptly announced his decision yesterday although this would be yesterday, talking about yesterday, to quit Congress early, Representative Ken Buck said of the dysfunction on Capitol Hill, as we know, the worst year of the nine years and three months that he's been in Congress, uh, many others say the worst in 40 or 50 years, and uh, he goes on to uh, denigrate it even farther, specifically calling out his fellow Republicans. He said, we've taken impeachment and we've made it a social media issue as opposed to a constitutional concept this place keeps going downhill, and I don't need to spend more time here. All right. You got it. Uh, happy to see you on your way out the door. Let's see. What other uh, ideas does uh, Greg have for top stories of the day? Hmm. Uh, oh, look at this. Well, I don't know what this one is about, but uh, it's got lots of bleepable language in it. 
Jeff Tidrick, of course. So, uh, Rude Pundit. Uh, or is that... Uh, I'm sorry, am I mixing the two of them up? Yeah, I think so. No, uh, that's odd. Well, they're very similar, if not the same person. I can't keep track of anybody anymore, even though this is... Uh, both are people who've been around for a decade. Anyway... Uh, What is this? Handy Oakley's days in Congress are numbered as the house gop freaks the F out. Boo effing who? I don't even. You know what? This is odd. I couldn't even tell you who uh, who we're talking about here. All right. Well, that's odd. Anyway, the, the point here is that the news is about dysfunction, not just in Congress overall, but inside of the Republican conference and everybody kind of wanting out as soon as possible. Okay. Then, of course, uh, a couple of look back on the stupid uh, theme that, that should be precluded to the Trump campaign this year, but instead uh, they seem determined to go forward with the are you better off now than you were four years ago? And reminding everybody that four years ago uh, all the uh, markets were out of toilet paper and no one knew how their kids were going to go to school and... Uh, the president was, of course, saying everything will disappear and everybody should be back in church for Easter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But today's look back uh, includes also a look forward. Uh, will Bunch in the Philly Inquirer noting voters don't have a clue about how much worse Trump's second term would be. Many voters seem fooled that Trump 47 would be a bland replay of Trump 45, not the authoritarian nightmare he actually plans. Although, again, well... Uh, Trump makes plans and it doesn't take God to laugh. Pretty much everybody else laughs as well. But uh, let's see. Here's a sampling of uh, other people not laughing about it and taking it seriously. Gameli Fenuku, a 22-year-old black college student in Richmond, Virginia, is exactly the demographic you'd think would never vote for Donald Trump in November. And indeed, he may not. But Fenuku told the New York Times... He hasn't ruled out supporting the presumptive GOP nominee either, and that's because he remembers his teen years under Trump as a time when a lot of things were a lot better than he sees them now, especially the economy. Hmm. It is possible that he had no idea what the economy was like when he was a teenager, as most teenagers don't, but who knows? Maybe he was really hooked in uh, and is out of touch now. That's a possibility. The Virginia College student is the face of a phenomenon that is shaping the 2024 rematch between Trump and President Joe Biden with less than eight months to go. The polls and interviews suggest a lot of voters are responding no to the ex-president's borrowing of Ronald Reagan's famous question, are you better off now than you were four years ago? This despite Trump's army of detractors calling his collective this a collective amnesia about a twice impeached president who nearly four years ago was wondering if Americans should be drinking bleach to tackle COVID-19. Less than three and a half years after the U.S. electorate made Trump the first 21st century president to lose re-election and by a solid 7 million vote margin, a poll taken by a liberal climate group found 52% of today's voters now approve of Trump's former presidency. Hmm, that's a suspect poll, I'll certainly uh, say that. Let's see. Uh, Interesting note here from Bill Scher in the Washington Monthly noting Biden doesn't need guilty verdicts. To win. We'll see about that. Any strategy to defeat Trump should not be premised on help from the judiciary. That's certainly true. Most national polls show Donald Trump leading Joe Biden. But when pollsters ask whom would voters prefer if Trump was convicted of a felony, Biden always comes out on top. This understandably makes Democrats eager for Trump's many trials to get underway and deeply anxious when Trump's delay tactics succeed. But The delays are an implicit reminder that nothing is certain about the outcome of the Trump trials, and any strategy to defeat Trump should not be premised on help from the judiciary. I can certainly agree with that uh, premise. Uh, I don't know what to make of the other one, but I'd certainly rather run against him as a convict uh, if I have the choice. Okay, let's see. Other things we uh, might sample from out of here? Hmm. Well, you know what? Uh, we'll probably dip back in at some point and pull out a few other things. And I don't want to use them all up because some of these are going to be things that uh, Greg will be easier, eager to use perhaps on Monday if he's able to return to the program. And uh, 
Well, I have my own uh, series of things that we've put away in pocket that I think we ought to uh, get to before it gets too late into the program. And some of them, you know, it's Friday. Long read stuff might be of uh, might, might be the order of the day, as it turns out. All right. Well, let's see. There's a new development in Alexander Smirnov's life and the record on this guy. The Guardian reported this piece. U.S. firm that paid indicted FBI informant tied to Trump Associates records reveal. And I skimmed through this a little bit yesterday, and this appears to be a rather complicated and somewhat convoluted relationship. But this is very often the way Trump world moves money around in order to pay for these projects. The headline, I guess, sums it up best. If you can do, if you want to, need to do a too long didn't read. A U.S. firm that paid indicted FBI informant Smirnov is tied to Trump associates. Alexander Smirnov was paid. $600,000 in 2020. That's amazing. The same year that he began allegedly lying to the FBI about Biden's role in Ukraine businesses. Jacqueline Sweet is a reporter for The Guardian on this one. An American company that paid the now indicted FBI informant Alexander Smirnov in 2020 is connected to a UK company owned by Trump business associates in Dubai according to business filings and court documents. Smirnov is now accused of lying to the FBI about Hunter Biden and his father, Joe Biden, in case you didn't know who his father was, alleging that they engaged in a bribery scheme with executives at the Ukrainian energy company Burisma. Okay, that much we know, right? Smirnov's accounts to the FBI beginning in 2020 that federal prosecutors now say are fabrications served as a major justification of the House impeachment investigation into the Bidens, Republican lawmakers have repeatedly touted Smirnov as a reliable informant, and the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, James Comer, even threatened to hold the FBI director, Christopher Wray, in contempt unless he handed over a June 2020 FBI form with Smirnov's claims to the committee. And then they got it, and then they read it, even though the warnings were, it's raw intelligence and it hasn't been vetted thoroughly, and to the extent it has been vetted, it doesn't sound like it's going to hold together. Back in 2020, Smirnov was paid $600,000, that's quite a bit, by a company called Economic Transformation Technologies, ETT. Phone, phone, home, I guess. ETT. Okay, prosecutor said. That same year, Smirnov began lying to the FBI about the Bidens, according to the indictment. What was the $600,000 for? No one knows. There's a little chart here. And I don't know whether this helpfully explains anything visually, but it doesn't matter because this isn't a visual medium. But it's telling us that Andrew Alexander Smirnov, in chart form, received $600,000 from ETT, based in Texas, whose CEO, I guess this is the too long didn't read, you should read the chart. The CEO of ETT is Christopher Condon, who is a 33% shareholder in ETT Investment Holding a company based in London. Who else owns part of this firm? He owns one-third. Who else owns it? Shahal Khan and Farouk Arjomand. I don't know whether they're all 33% shareholders, but those are two of the other major shareholders. They, Khan and Arjomand, both have ties to Donald Trump. Okay, so does Christopher Condon not have any? I don't know. But some two-thirds, I guess, or thereabouts of the company is owned by people who have business ties to Donald Trump. Let's find out what they are. ETT's CEO is the American Christopher Condon, who, and remember, this is The Guardian. That's why they refer to him as the American. Like, this isn't, this isn't the most American guy ever or anything like that. Super American Christopher Condon. But anyway, he is also one of three shareholders. I guess they all do, or on a third. Well, not necessarily, right? Somebody could have 50%, and I don't know. Anyway, uh, he's one of three shareholders in ETT Investment Holding Limited in London. Other shareholders in the UK include the Pakistani-American investor Shahal Khan and Farooq Arjomand, a former chairman and current board member of Damak Properties in Dubai, who was also 
listed as an advisor on ETT's American website. So, last month, Smirnoff was charged with lying to the FBI and is being held without bail. Good idea. Prosecutors argued he posed a flight risk because of his contacts with Russian officials in the Middle East and access to millions of dollars. And don't leave out the multiple passports. Smirnov's indictment alleged that the assertions in a document known as a 1023, that's the FBI form, where they fill out where you come in and give a statement, you're an informant, write it down. On what? Back of an envelope? No. Form 1023. Smirnov's indictment alleged that this document and other statements made to his FBI handler beginning in 2020 and continuing until December 2023 were factually impossible. The exact business model of Texas-based ETT is murky. Its mission statement reads in part, oh, that won't clear anything up, a mission statement, ETT sets up the chessboard to bring in top-notch executives from those sectors, some, they must have told us what sectors they were earlier, to help implement its vision of Love and social impact, hmm, to improve the quality of human existence, that's good, through the application of new age technologies. What do they do? Nobody knows. They had gave them $600,000 based on nothing. Uh, well, all corporate vision statements are, are pretty much the same, but... Uh, I don't know. This one clears up nothing, certainly. The current CEO, Condon, is a California man, though the company is based in Texas, who's been involved in several civil lawsuits, including a civil RICO case in 2010 that he won on appeal. I guess he lost down below. All right. Condon's official biography says he is, quote, a former professional tennis player. Anyone know him? A financial advisor and currently is an entrepreneur focused on social impact projects, public-private partnerships, and creating smart communities that benefit both individuals and governments. Gobbledygook. Condon, Arjumand, and Khan registered ETT Investment Holding Limited in the UK on March 6th, 2020. So, again, nearly four years ago, and uh, in the run-up to the pandemic. What a great time to be incorporating. Khan, an investor who purchased the Plaza Hotel in 2018, that's, I guess, the connection to Donald Trump, and Arjumand have ties to Donald Trump through Trump Associates and Damak, a major, major, major Middle East developer that has partnered with Trump for a decade. Arjumand, Khan, and Condon owned 34 33 and 33 percent of ETT Investment Holding Limited, respectively. That's our answer. According to UK business filings, no other information on the UK company is readily available. The former Damak chairman, Hussein Sajwani, is also close to Trump and has been described as his friend in multiple news reports. That's probably never true, but okay. Trump has called the billionaire a friend and a great man and his family the most beautiful people. Which really, I mean, it's good for building a case against Trump, usually, because he says such dumb things. And you tell a jury, didn't you say that he was a great friend and a great man and had the most beautiful family? I've never seen him before in my entire life. You know, this is just something he says about everybody. And, and the record it would seem to indicate that that's true. Anyway. Sajwani attended Trump's 2016 inauguration, and Trump's sons, Donald Jr. and Eric Trump, attended the 2017 ribbon-cutting of the Trump International Golf Club in Dubai, licensed by Dumak in 2014. Right, so no overseas deals while he's president, except for the ones that we've already done and the ones we start. Anyway, Sajwani and his family also attended a party in in. 2017 at Pervalago Sex Dungeon, so we get a little of insight into what they're like. Trump's sons would go on to attend Sajwani's daughter's wedding in 2018. Don't know him, just a coffee boy. We go to each other's weddings. No big deal. In 2017 FEC filings, Trump disclosed making up to $5 million from the Damak licensing deal, but said he would no longer do personal business deals when he became president. The two continued at least talking business into his presidency, however, according to multiple reports. How do we know that's true? Trump said it wasn't. So there you go. Hussein 
Demock, a friend of mine, a great guy. I was offered $2 billion to do a deal in Dubai, a number of deals. I turned it down, Trump said in 2017. Arjumand was the vice chairman of Damak when the Trump International Golf Club, along with the adjoining Trump-branded luxury homes, opened. And he replaced Sajwani as chair in 2021 when Sajwani stepped down to privatize the company. Khan, who owns Dubai-based Trinity White City Ventures, is a New York native who partnered with New York City developer Kamran Hakim to buy the Plaza Hotel in 2018 for $600 million. He was a board member of ETT from 2019 to June of 2020, according to his LinkedIn page, appearing in event photographs with Condon in Miami that year. Uh, during COVID, no? Or 2019, perhaps. Khan is involved in a range of business from AI to mining to cybersecurity, according to his official biographies. In 2019, he was one of a dozen Pakistani-American business owners invited to meet the then-Pakistani Prime Minister, Imran Khan, the day before Imran met with Trump and Mike Pompeo, then Secretary of State, in Washington, D.C. The group was there to discuss the expansion of business in Pakistan. In 2017, Khan reportedly approached Brad Zaxon, dubbed Paul Manafort's real estate fixer, to help him broker a deal to buy the Roosevelt Hotel in Manhattan, owned by the Pakistani government via its national airline, for $500 million, according to The Real Deal. When the real estate publication asked Khan about the reports, he denied that Zaxon and Manafort, the former Trump campaign chairman, were involved. I mean, that's a good denial. I would deny that, too. Khan purchased the Pakistani embassy building in D.C. for uh, $6.8 million in 2022. Khan is also CEO of Burtech Acquisition Group, a Blank check company or public shell company. I guess is that something like uh, akin to the SPACs that we were reading about? Patrick Orlando. Oh, I think we've heard that name before. Listed as special advisor and shareholder of Burtech in 2021 was the CEO and chair of Digital World, another blank check company. That's the one we know, the SPAC, from September 2021 to March 2023 when it began a merger with Trump Media and Technology Group in 2021. It was held up by an SEC investigation until given the green light last month. He's uh, the guy who, uh, yeah, right, formed the company that then tried to merge with the parent company of Truth Social to try to take that public. Okay, he's also on the board of this Burtech acquisition group with Khan. Okay, getting it. The finalization of the merger may garner Trump as much as $4 billion in shares, he says anyway, and help bolster his finances after his recent civil litigation losses. Orlando has known Trump since at least 2021, according to news reports. Arjumand and Khan's relationship is unclear. Arjumand, a former HSBC banker from the United Arab Emirates, also invests in hospitality businesses, including the celebrity Wahlberg Brothers restaurant chain, Wahlburgers, and owns a coffee company called Reborn Coffee. Okay, important somehow, maybe. ETT Investment Holding Limited, ooh, that was funny, uh, was dissolved in 2021. Condon and Arjumond also registered a company called Atlas UK Group Limited the same day that they registered the UK ETT, which has now been dissolved. The American ETT, then called Pandora Venture Capital Corp., okay, was first registered in Florida in 2014 by a Wisconsin resident, Boris Naflish. Okay. <laughs> According to Florida business filings, Ukrainian-American Naflish hmm, is the ex-husband of Smirnov's current partner, according to a Wall Street Journal report. That is interesting. Which also na claimed Nayflish stayed close to his ex, Diana Lavrenyuk, Lavren, Lavrenyuk, maybe, uh, and Smirnov after the divorce. Smirnov, also born in Ukraine, by the way, lived in Israel before coming to the U.S. in 2006. 
Pandora changed its name to Skylab in 2017, really. And then in 2018, Skylab seemed to split from what is now ETT, according to a lawsuit, when Condon first registered ETT websites and appeared on ETT's Florida filings. An unnamed former business associate told the Wall Street Journal that the $600,000 payment from ETT to Smirnov was, here's the important part, right, quote, in exchange for a stake in an Israeli-based crypto trading platform called uh, Bitov, it's either Bitov Trade or Bit of Trade. It's like, we'll do a little bit of trade, sure. It actually, it's all one word mashed together, but it does, it's spelled Bit of Trade. I don't know whether that's how they say it. And uh, Smirnov was working on launching this thing. Well, that's an interesting thing. That's a lot of money for somebody who's launching something that doesn't make any money yet. Okay. Calls and emails to Condon, Arjuman, Sajwani, and Smirnov's lawyer and to Trump's team, of course, not returned. Khan told The Guardian, I was on the board for a very short period and there was no connection on my part. All like uh, Burisma, I guess. Wow. How interesting that they don't believe the Burisma claims when other people say, I was only nominally involved. But of course, that's their excuse for themselves. Smirnov is scheduled for a jury trial in April, according to court filings. So that's it's convoluted stuff. It may lead nowhere, except it does establish that in Trump world, where they very frequently just pass checks to one another to get dubious things done for dubious reasons, uh, there are in fact connections. And then, of course, some weird familial con- connections. And one guy's uh, uh, ex-wife is now with Smirnoff, and that's unusual as well. Uh, mix and match overseas outfits, uh, buying hotels from Trump, the whole bit. Okay. Just interesting. Sup, fam? It's your boy Darwin, aka Darwin underscore Darko, aka the most reasonable man in America, aka KITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spacemen vs. Space Cadets and We Need to Talk About Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organization strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept a life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes you, can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagorx at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kagor in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's see, there is some more. Believe it or not, there's actually more on this subject and Marcy Wheeler has got it. So I don't know that the things are going to clear up any, <laughs> but more things will be said about the various ties uh, between Trump world and Alexander Smirnov. Here it is, a third tie between Trump world and Alexander Smirnov. And uh, it's not clear just from the headline whether this is a name or tie that we didn't hear anything about or maybe, I don't know. But anyway, let's see what uh, Marcy has to say about it. But warning at the beginning here, before I point to a report, she says, on a third known link between Alexander Smirnov, the FBI informant, you know who he is, uh, but by the way, the way she puts it, he's the FBI informant whose allegedly false claims about Joe Biden were laundered through a process that Bill Barr set up for Rudy Giuliani to do this in 2020. So before she points to a third known link between Smirnov and Trump, she uh, begs your leave to let me lay out several details that are important to assessing the import, uh, uh, the import, she likes to say, of such ties. The importance. One, 
Uh, and they're not numbered, but they're just bullet points. Smirnov was admonished on the limits of permission to engage in otherwise illegal activities by the FBI when he was an informant, right? Uh, can I do some of these illegal things in order to, like, gather evidence about other people that I could give you as an informant? Well, the FBI doesn't really, uh, you know, feel great about endorsing the idea of you doing some otherwise illegal things. But as long as we know what you're up to, maybe sort of you can go ahead and do it. But they were uh, wary of him and they had limits on what they were going to allow him to do. So on five occasions, he is admonished on the limits of these otherwise ac illegal activities, including on August 7th, 2020, mid-early pandemic, right? Anyway. Uh, I don't know if that matters, but that's the date. Well, that's when the FBI, or that, rather, that's what the FBI does. Before they pre-approve you committing a crime because they want to learn about the other people committing crimes along with you, right? So, for any given sketchy business that someone reports Smirnov to have engaged in, there's a distinct possibility that he was engaging in it because the FBI was interested in the other people engaged in the business. All right. Uh, I mean, he's also kind of sketchy, but there is that. Next, Smirnov's ties to Russian spies go through at least one other intelligence service, probably Israel. But at least for the last six months, he has been hanging out on the mega yachts of Russian oligarchs, almost certainly in Dubai, where, according to him, he was part of a plan to end the Ukraine war and elect Donald Trump. One unanswered question that will be key to understanding how Smirnov attempted to frame Joe Biden is to identify how MAGA U.S. attorney for Pittsburgh, Scott Brady, came to chase an otherwise unremarkable earlier Smirnov informant report mentioning Hunter Biden in passing. Given that Brady's project catered to Rudy, any link involving Rudy as well would be significant. But... We may not discover that unless something dramatic happens because David Weiss, the special prosecutor in this case, has no business overseeing this investigation as he's a direct witness to the involvement of Brady and Bill Barr. Indeed, as Hunter Biden attorney Abby Lowell recently pointed out, Weiss has misrepresented his involvement in the Smirnoff lead going back to 2020. And by chasing this lead and extending the prosecution of Hunter Biden, he's effectively doing Russia's bidding. We already know of two ties between Trump world and Smirnov. His cousin, Lenore Schaefer, has ties to Trump through a Miami real estate developer. And here a poll quote from what source are we looking at? Daily Mail. Not everybody's favorite, but it's there. Schaefer or Schaefer. S-H-E-F-E-R. A 38-year-old Israeli-American was a former contestant on the Israeli version of the reality show Big Brother and in 2014 won the Moscow beauty pageant Miss Jewish Star. So I guess that clears up gender for us. And, uh, and Trump's reasoning for getting involved with her probably as well. According to her LinkedIn page, she has been an in-house consultant for Deezer Development in Miami, or Deezer, I'm not certain which, D-E-Z-E-R, Deezer Development in Miami, Florida since 2022. Like a long history with them, huh? Deezer partnered with Trump's organization, of course, to develop the $600 million Trump Grand Ocean Resort, grand with an E on the end, grand, grand ocean resort and residences. That's one big development and $900 million Trump Towers. OK, the company is run by Gil Dezer and that's where the name comes from. And he founded uh, oh, is founded also by his Israeli American billionaire father, Michael, who is a Trump donor. Too many billionaires. At this point, but I like that. Too. The company's run by Gil Dazer. Wow, that's impressive. Gil, how did you? Oh, your father's a billionaire and he just gave you a company? Okay. And Smirnov has ties to Sam Kislin, who not only has long standing ties to Rudy and Trump, but who came under some scrutiny during the 2019 impeachment. Uh, what are we looking at here? Mm, the ties to Rudy are established in the New York Post, the Daily Beast recording his ties to Trump. 
Uh, I don't know who they're, which one they're quoting from here. But here's the pull quote. Around 2021, on the beach at a private club in Boca Raton, Smirnov pitched Kislin on founding a company together. Sure, why not? That would market electric car batteries and capture federal subsidies, Kislin said. Smirnov told him he could use his FBI ties to help him unfreeze more than $21 million in infrastructure bonds that belonged to Kislin, but which Ukrainian authorities deemed to have been issued illegally, embroiling Kislin in a corruption probe, Kislin said. Kislin had for years been seeking to unfreeze the funds, traveling to Ukraine and meeting with officials there. His travels there coincided with efforts by Giuliani and his associates to push the Ukrainian government to investigate Biden. And in 2019, Kislin was subpoenaed by House impeachment investigators who were looking into those efforts. Kislin's lawyer said he didn't have relevant information and he ultimately didn't testify. Smirnov set his fee for recovering Kislin's $21 million at $1 million, according to Kislin, who said he paid Smirnov $224,000, partially as an advance and partially as an investment in the car battery company, incorporated in Nevada in May of 2021 as Quantum Force. I guess you just meet a guy on the beach and say, give me a quarter million dollars and I'll start a car company, car battery company. And also I uh, am going to, uh, what was the other thing? Oh yeah, recover $21 million in frozen Ukrainian infrastructure bonds for you. Okay, sure. A little after, I don't understand like living in this world, but okay, a little after, uh, over a year rather, uh, Quantum Force dissolved, oh my goodness, and registered by the same name in a different state, oh this time without Smirnov listed in the corporate records. When a solution to Kislin's problem in Ukraine failed to materialize, Kislin said he deduced that Smirnov had taken him for a ride. Yeah, but I guess that's your fault for being at the beach at the same time. Uh, sometimes I go to the beach and give strangers a quarter million dollars too. The Guardian reports or points to a third, through uh, one through another of the sketchy businesses with which Smirnov worked, which includes a Middle East real estate tie. Okay, and that's the one, I guess, that we just read about, ETT and ETT Holdings. We don't need to read all that again. The Wall Street Journal's story, the same one that focused on Kislin, already laid out some sketchy aspects of Smirnov's ties to ETT and states that the relationship began in 2019. Another poll quote here. Smirnov helped another company, Texas-based Economic Transformation Technologies, a software platform. They didn't even mention that. Like, what is it? A software platform focused on sovereign economic performance. Uh, so Smirnov helped this other company solicit investors starting around 2019. Former associate said Smirnov was aware of concerns among investors and employees about some of the company's practices. One of the associates said the company was failing to pay some of its bills and several of its employees, despite spending lavishly on travel and maintaining its exorbitant rent in the Dallas Cowboys headquarters. Former associates and investors said still Smirnov brought in investors to meet with the company's chairman, Christopher Condon and other company executives, among them Kislin, who didn't ultimately invest. Condon described Smirnov to associates as a Russian friend of ours who is skilled at fundraising, a former associate said. It described that Condon knew of Smirnov's FBI ties. Smirnov's FBI connections often came up in conversation as he hawked his services. Condon, the ETT chairman, also told people that Smirnov had friends in the FBI and described him as his protector who could help shield him from investigations former associate said. That's not a great situation. Condon's lawyer said Condon didn't know the extent of Smirnov's FBI involvement and Condon denied describing Smirnov as a protector. I'd back away from that one too. Now Marcy concludes, there are a lot more details of the Trump ties of Khan and Arjumand in the Guardian piece. We read it already. What's not included in there is the date in 2020 that ETT paid Smirnov. Particularly, given Condon's other sketchy ties, if that payment was anywhere close to August of 2020, when we know Smirnov was given permission to engage in otherwise illegal activity, it may be 
his business ties were done with the knowledge and permission of the FBI. Of course, the people with whom he engaged in otherwise illegal activities, OA, OIA for short, could well have a link to Scott Brady's discovery of Smirnov. That's why it's so problematic that Weiss, a witness, is leading this investigation. In a status hearing for Hunter Biden yesterday, at which his gun trial was tentatively scheduled for the first two weeks of June, prosecutor Derek Hines suggested that the Smirnov trial is still set to go starting on April 23rd, in spite of a recent SEPA filing. I can't recall what the the, the acronym is for, but okay. Uh, also yesterday, Judge Otis Wright denied Smirnov's bid to be released to San Francisco to receive glaucoma care. Hmm, okay. Well, there you go. So, uh, yet more weird and shady connections, not the, you know, the, the clear import of all of them, not immediately obvious all the time, but definitely, uh, clearly a, a rather shady network, always a shady network of operators around Donald Trump. Uh, but I guess what we're getting at here is the, uh, the background against which Scott Brady first becomes aware that there's someone out there that will feed him garbage intel on Hunter Biden that he can kick up the chain to Rudy Giuliani and Bill Barr, the straight shooter who leaves in the end, right? Uh, all, uh, all operating on the same page to try to get f information fabricated or otherwise that implicates the Bidens up the chain. And uh, weird, to say the least. And also just weird how many people exist in this weird world where, I don't know, I was on the beach and I saw another guy who looked kind of rich and we decided to give each other a million dollars. I don't really, I don't know what to say about that. Anyway, uh, it's on the radar and we'll see whether things clear up anytime in the near future. We noted yesterday uh, the importance of uh, Chuck Schumer's speech on the on his call for new elections in Israel to try and essentially to push Netanyahu and his right wing uh, coalition government out uh, over a number of things, not the least of which the prosecution of the Gaza war and, of course, the predictable Republican response. Oh, this is horrible. You're interfering in their elections. And naturally, the Israelis feel well, some of the Israelis feel the same way as well. Uh, but. Uh, yes, building and increasing calls for, hmm, uh, well, for elections, certainly, and for pushing Netanyahu out of the picture, if that's even possible. But uh, I thought a welcome uh, shift in the politics in Washington. Everybody is somewhat shocked over it, I suppose, uh, but uh, shouldn't be, and it was a long time coming. But... Um, apparently made a splash and uh, uh there were some interesting long read pieces that i thought might be of interest in the israel context there are a couple of them um and uh i wonder if we might not share some of these this one uh well see well, we might as well start now because uh, it doesn't make that much difference that we're interrupted by a break necessarily. But this was an interesting piece, I thought, which not so much on the news side of things, but rather uh, might be a helpful insight to some who uh, perhaps, you know, don't really grasp or, or may I, I guess I should say people who haven't been involved in necessarily in the Israel issue for all of their lives because either they're not Jewish or whatever other reason there might be for not paying any particular attention to things. Um, but who have come, particularly for those who've come late in life, to the understanding of what Zionism is and isn't and why anybody would cling to a an ideology that's gotten such a negative connotation attached to it of late uh 
at least by people who are late comers to the issue. There are, of course, people who have been living with the issue on the other side for all of their lives and come naturally to that negative connotation of Zionism. But why would it... It's it's a mystery, I think, to a lot of people why who are not Jewish, in particular, are not Palestinian uh, either, why anybody would uh, be so hard-pressed to either uh, give up on the ideology or why they would cling to such an ideology. And uh, those of you who have been following the issue for a long time, particularly those because you are Jewish or are, are, are familiar with Jewish-American approaches to Israel <clears throat> might recognize something in this. So I thought it was very interesting and worthy of sharing. Do I have uh, the original open here so I can uh, credit everything properly? It's in the New York magazine, and uh, it probably won't let me even display the original page. So we'll just trust Pocket that it is Abraham Reisman, Reisman R-I-E-S-M-A-N, the writer behind the piece, Allegedly, according to Pocket, but uh, it won't let me. Well, let me see if I can real quick scroll. And uh, nope, oh, too too slow. Uh, sometimes the uh, Pocket version of who has written it is uh, incorrect for certain publications more so than others. However, even if the credit isn't being properly given, we'll try again later. Uh, let's read this. Okay, well, here. Uh, the piece is My Grandfather the Zionist, which in this day and age, in this particular moment, is a, a uh, <clears throat> uh, reads like a charge being leveled against him. It is illustrated with a photo of his grandfather speaking at a fundraising event. Uh, it's Bob Reisman or Reisman. I'm not certain which is the pronunciation here that they prefer. Delivering a fundraising speech at an emergency meeting of Rhode Island's General Jewish Committee during Israel's Six-Day War in 1967. The article, uh, this article, in fact, it notes in italics here, was featured in One Great Story, New York's reading recommendation newsletter. So, I don't know if that matters to you, but uh, it's here and it was important to them. All right, on to the story. On February 25th, 1986, my grandfather, Robert Arnold Reisman Sr., delivered a speech at his synagogue in Providence, Rhode Island. Grandpa was a lantern-jawed, even-tempered man, an industrialist, a philanthropist, and a bona fide war hero, which made it all the more striking when on occasions such as this he invoked life's horrors like a fire-and-brimstone shtetl rabbi. He began with a story of Dr. Joseph Mengele, the infamous mad scientist of the Nazi camps, who had been tried in absentia in Israel the year before. He quoted the testimony of a Jewish survivor who had been forced by Mengele to starve her own newborn child to death. The child grew thinner and thinner, weaker and weaker. Every day Mengele would come and look at it. A nurse secretly procured some morphine to put the baby out of its misery. You want me to kill my own child? She asked the nurse. I can't do it. We had a big argument until I did it. I murdered my own child. Yikes, right? Grandpa then quoted the rabbi, Irving Yitz Greenberg, about how the Holocaust taught Jews that power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely, but absolute powerlessness corrupts even more. Hmm. My grandfather, a whisperer to two U.S. senators and a former president of the Rhode Island Jewish Federation, was far from powerless, and he made it his business to get the world to know and care about what was happening to the Jews. And the most effective way to do it was to rally American Jews around the common goal that united the vast majority of them, regardless of denomination, location, or political party, at that point, the defense of the Jewish state. My grandfather's aim that winter night was to goad his listeners into being more ardent supporters of what he proudly referred to as the pro-Israel lobby. That's a lot dirtier sounding these days, but there it is, of which he was a significant component. 
Exercise your rights as a citizen, he told the crowd, for your children and grandchildren, for the powerless who died in the Warsaw Ghetto or the death camps, who never had the chance to live free in Israel, and for who those and, and for those who today live free in Israel and want to stay that way. Was my grandfather thinking of me, and of course this is being written by a modern day anti, at least anti-Israeli government, and possibly fully anti-Zionist Jewish person, was my grandfather thinking of me when he spoke of Mengele? Just 11 weeks prior, he had been cradling my infant body in his arms, blessing and cooing at his firstborn grandchild in the maternity ward. His speech drew a straight line between Jewish powerlessness and the deaths of Jewish infants because he genuinely believed the two were inextricable. In his eyes, Israel was always under mortal threat, and if its foes were to defeat it, there would be mass Jewish death there on a scale with which his generation was all too familiar. If his people lost their citadel in the Middle East, who knew what other dominoes might fall? The scion of his own line could be next. Such was the argument. Such is the argument still. And look where it got us. In my grandfather's day, Israel was the great unifier of the American Jewish community. Now it is the great divider, both inside our own community and in cleavages with other ones. Bring up Israel with any American Jew and you can feel the atmosphere tighten. There is no topic that incenses us more, whether the emotions are pride or shame, defensiveness or hatred, fear that not enough of our co-religionists support the Jewish state, or rage that they support it too much. There are those among us who have opted out of the conversation altogether, but one can run only so far these days. It is impossible to ignore the denunciations of Israel that have featured in both traditional and social media since fighting between Israelis and Palestinians escalated this May. Jews and Gentiles who had previously betrayed no interest in the topic have taken up the cause of Palestinians who were governed and besieged and, in many cases, killed by an occupying state. I think I ought to double-check the date of our work here. Yeah. Since I said, since I mentioned that the fighting escalated in May, you're probably thinking of fighting that escalated in October. So I might as well uh, point out to you, yeah, this is an older article. Uh, I'll try and double check the date here, but no, to no avail, not even allowed to scroll down the page. The, the date, though, as given by the pocket version, June 23rd, 2021. So still quite as relevant. And I guess... That uh, actually, I, I, I think, underscores the relevance that this article was written in June of 2021 and helps explain a very, very current situation. That's not that many years ago or anything, but you think for a situation that changes on a daily basis, um, it might not be as relevant. But in fact, I think it is. And it's still necessary to explain. And, and although it was explained very well in 2021, not everyone read it. Not everyone has heard this story. So where were we? Um, yes, it's impossible to ignore the denunciations of Israel, uh, even before the current round of them, uh, since, uh, in this case, since fighting escalated in May of 2021, uh, People on both sides, people on every side have uh, who have previously betrayed no interest in the topic have taken up the cause of Palestinians who are governed and besieged, in many cases, killed by an occupying state. Although Twitter, as they say, is not real life, it's often a leading indicator of where real life is headed, and the conversation about Israel increasingly heralds disaster and disunity for Jews of the United States. My grandfather, had he not died in 2004, would almost certainly be infuriated by the left's response to Israel's recent actions, not even these recent actions, but those other ones, and probably, all, of course, all over again, Israel's recent actions and penned passionate defenses and delivered fiery addresses, which is to say he'd probably be infuriated by me. And again, this is fascinating that it was written in the last round of fighting, but it's almost certainly equally applicable right now. I used to be one of those Jews who had no particular interest in Israel. For whatever reason, Grandpa never really talked to me about it. 
Perhaps he thought I wasn't old enough to understand, and neither did my parents. But in recent years, I've developed a level of fixation on the place, both personal and journalistic, that rivals even that of my grandfather. The conclusions we have come to, however, are worlds apart. I have not come here to denounce my grandfather, and, 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 and that's important, I think. One of the important things to understand, even when you're talking to somebody who's highly critical of Israel, there's also this part that says, well, I mean, there are individuals or people to whom I owe certain allegiance that by rights should stand accused under my blanket accusation against Israel, but uh, against whom I hold my tongue. I have not come here to denounce my grandfather or to defend him. I've come to tell his story. Although his life had its unique contours, his journey illuminates much about the birth, ascent, and decline of the American Jewish community's pro-Israel consensus. That's what we're here after. And while I'm reluctant to discuss any of this, family is the lens through which one must look to figure out how and why it all went wrong. For there are two questions every Jew has to answer when it comes to the dizzying topic of Israel. Who counts as your family? And what would you do to protect them? I think that's the right context. My grandfather's father, Joseph Reisman, never talked about the old country. There are no extant family stories about his place of birth. No one even knows for sure where it was. In my archival searches for genealogical information, I've come across many forms on which Joe or his brother were ordered to give their town or city of origin, and they always just wrote Russia, which doesn't exactly narrow it down during that nation's late imperial period. However, my grandfather once did an interview in which he mentioned his dad coming from the same place as a business partner, and that partner's naturalization record says he emerged from Sudlico, uh, pronunciation unknown for me, a small town in the western half of Ukraine, once again in our news. When Joe was born in 1897, just over 2,700 Jews, including, as it says parenthetically, Steven Spielberg's maternal great-grandparents, lived there. There was a time when it was known for the delicate art of weaving Jewish prayer shawls, a famous rabbi used to give passionate sermons at a local synagogue. Today, the residents call the town Sudlikiv. You're unlikely to find a single Jew among them, by the way. Although the near extermination of European Jewry was still decades away as of Joe's birth, uh, oh, getting ready for our break here, the mass murderer of Jews was still common in that part of the world, and the Reismans got out just in time to experience the miracle of class mobility that came for many Jews from Slavic lands who migrated to the United States. Joe's father, Philip, arrived in Boston the same year Joe was born. Joe followed sometime between 1899 and 1902, there are conflicting records, along with mother Anna and brother Meyer. So more of the family story after this short break. Welcome back now to the K-Grown in the Morning Show here on Ed Roots Radio. Let's continue reading through this. This is very, uh, it's interesting reading for me. I don't know if it's uh, helpful for you necessarily, but I mean, this really parallels the familial experience for so many people of, uh, I guess, of a certain age, but um, so many Jewish American families kind of following the same trajectory. And uh, so where were we? We left off with... Uh, the arrival of the family sometime between, you know, late 1890s, early 1900s. And the family chose, in this case, heavily Jewish Boston suburb of Chelsea as their new home and were thus surrounded by fellow members of the tribe. Now, that said, while American anti-Semitism might have been less violent than that of Europe, it was undeniably a fact of life. There were countless professions from which Philip was excluded due to his heritage. So he became a junk dealer, picking up or buying scrap metal and other materials for resale. Eventually, his sons joined the family business and transformed it into a successful electrical equipment manufacturing company, 
known as Royal Electric. Don't know if that rings a bell from any, for anybody in that area. Maybe my mom. She was from the Boston area. In a classically Jewish contribution to America, they were known for being the world's second largest manufacturer of Christmas lights. Royal Electric. How interesting. The Reismans placed a high value on humanitarian work. By all accounts, a buoyant and inspiring presence, Joe used his newfound wealth and influence to improve the world around him, as did Meyer. My family, from the earliest days I remember, were involved either in temple activities or in philanthropy. My grandfather would later recall in a deeply revealing 1984 oral history for the United Jewish Appeal a philanthropic organization that raised funds for Israeli initiatives. Uh, couldn't have grown up in that era without being, as a Jewish person, and not be aware of the United Jewish Appeal. It just came naturally. It was part of what the family did. That's Grandpa speaking there. Joe's efforts were not restricted to the Jewish community by any means. He donated enough to his alma mater, Northeastern University, that they named an auditorium and a laboratory after him. So if you're a Northeastern alum, do you know anything about uh, Reisman's or how it's pronounced? And maybe you've been there to the laboratory or uh, auditorium. But anyway, he never forgot about the Jews of the world who had not been so fortunate. In the 1930s, as the storm clouds darkened over Central Europe, Joe sig signed affidavits for the Refugee Resettlement Agency, known as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, helping Jews from Austria and Germany immigrate to the U.S. That uh, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, currently uh, at the heart of some of the dumbest and darkest dark web alt-right conspiracy theories about Jews and their role in immigration even today. And Jews will not replace us uh, comes from, I guess, the kernel of truth there as well. There was once this Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which also evolved to help other uh, oppressed minorities around the world likewise immigrate to the United States. And so therefore, all the people that we don't want to be here are Jewish people's fault. It doesn't really hang together logically, but that's sometimes what's at the heart of their weird conspiracy theories. Anyway, uh, at the time, unequivocally, a good and humanitarian thing to do. So where were we? Joe even had an immigrant family living in his house at one point, and he worked closely with refugee activist Walter Beringer, a neighbor and close friend. My great-grandfather's work in this realm saved lives, and it left a deep impression on his oldest son, Robert, my grandfather. That's where it's all coming from, right? People who actually not only uh, put their money where their mouth was, but actually even put their house up when necessary to sponsor refugee families. Born on January 25th, 1919, Robert, known by friends and family throughout his life as Bob, was a sharp, studious, tough-minded child. Bob's mother, Sta Sadie, uh, nay, is that how you pronounce that when they're talking about someone's... Uh, a birth name, Finkelstein was the family last name, Sadie Finkelstein, Bob's mom, a graceful and melancholic woman whom Joe met under circumstances lost to time, would say he was a born warrior, Bob was, as Bob put it in a different oral history many decades later, he gave several, I guess, my mother, who knew and understood me very well, said, I always knew you would become a soldier because you used to play with guns when you were a little boy and you had all these war games and you read about it and there was never any doubt in my mind that you would someday, if there were a war, be a part of it and want to be a part of it. They certainly viewed war differently those days. Young Bob was all too aware of the specter of Nazism and watched with horror as the rest of America shrugged over the fate of the Jews. When he enrolled at Harvard University in 1936, he entered an institution that had little use for his people. There were de facto quotas in place for Ivy League Jews in those days. And in order to convince Harvard to admit Bob, one of his Gentile recommenders felt compelled to remark, quote, he has little or none of the appearance of being a Jew. Great. I'll get you into Harvard. In the wake of Kristallnacht in 1938, Bob got a uh, Bob got together a group of students called the Harvard Committee for Tolerance 
And uh, right-wingers still insist that there needs to be one at Harvard. The Harvard Committee of Tolerance and pushed the school to take on Jewish students and professors from Germany. Not that kind of tolerance, goddammit. Uh, anyway, the administration refused, the right-wingers of their day. The 1930s were a radicalizing decade for my grandfather, but they didn't quite make him care about Jewish life in the Holy Land. Bob recalled his father dragging him to see Chaim Weitzman, a world-famous leader of the Zionist movement, speak in 1939 about America's paltry quotas for European Jewish refugees. I'll never forget what he said. By the time this thing is over, there may be a quarter of a million Jews left in Europe, at which time your problem will have been reduced to manageable proportions, Bob would later recall. He was moved, but there was a caveat. I did not see the connection between the existence of a place for them to go to and Israel. Such sentiments were quite common among American Jews before the Second World War, when Zionism hadn't yet come into fashion. Seeking Jewish self-determination somewhere outside of their home continent, European Zionists kept returning to Palestine, the Middle Eastern region, where the last attempt at Jewish self-determination had been crushed by Rome, nearly two millennia prior, and which remained an object of veneration and fascination in Jewish liturgy and scripture. The trouble was that there were already hundreds of thousands of people in Palestine. The arrival of territorially assertive Jewish settlers, they proudly called it a colonial project back then, when it still didn't have that negative connotation, I guess, well, uh, among Europeans who were doing the settling anyway, was met with resistance by the local Arab Muslims and Christians. By the time Bob saw Weitzman speak in 1939, there had been decades of intermittent violence between the Jewish and Arab populations of the Holy Land with no mutually acceptable resolution in sight. None of that ethnic strife mattered much to the Jews of America, generally speaking. Information from that part of the world was sparse and scattered, and Arab voices were rarely heard from. That's not to say Jewish Americans were all Zionists. Far from it. Most identified as non- or even anti-Zionist, not because of concern for the fate of Arab Palestinians, as they would come to be termed. The issue was life for Jews in the U.S., since a Jewish state might create a situation in which Jews could be accused of divided national loyalties. What's more, Jews had already found a significant degree of acceptance and peace in America and broadly held no desire to till the deserts of the Middle East. Bob was focused on Hitler back then. He had been a member of the ROTC since entering college, which was supremely unpopular moves in an isolationist era. He was not a closed-minded patriot, even going so far as to date a pro-Soviet leftist from Radcliffe, who, during the period of Nazi-Soviet non-aggression, vigorously opposed U.S. intervention on the side of the Allies. However, he never betrayed any doubts about his imminent mission, and he thought of it in very personal terms. When asked about the nature of his motivation for joining the army, he replied, I don't know how anti-fascist it was, but it had to be Jewish. Hmm. By the same, or rather, by the time of the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, Bob had already graduated from college and was serving at Fort Devens in Massachusetts. His day had come. He had become an artillery officer, and after a stop to train in Britain, he and his unit were sent to the North African Theater to fight Erwin Rommel, uh, Rommel yes, and the various Axis forces in Algeria and Tunisia. He participated in some crucial victories, then was sent to Sicily, where he got some shrapnel in his back and was sent back to Algeria to train in army intelligence. It's impossible to understand my grandfather's later feelings about Israel and Palestinians without a grasp of what he learned in World War II. When he was in intelligence, he found out before most of the world what was being done to Jews and others in Nazi death camps. Some people didn't believe it, he recalled. I had no trouble in believing it, whatever. My immediate response was, for God's sake, let's get on with the war. Let's invade Europe and defeat the Germans there. He made good on that urge, helping to plan D-Day from a base in the UK and thus advance the death blow against Hitler. By war's end, his youthful military inclinations had hardened into a sense of duty 
to whoever he perceived as being on his side. All we knew was that the more we killed, the sooner the war would be over and we would stop fighting and go home, he said. It was like keeping score at a football game. That's not a very nice answer, but I really didn't think of killing the enemy so much as taking the opposing pieces off a chessboard. Grandpa finished the war with a cushy placement overseeing the post-liberation military government in Paris, then returned to the U.S., met and abruptly married my grandmother, a fellow Massachusetts Jew whose family had achieved quasi-assimilated, quasi-patrician status, got a job at his dad's company, and bought a house in Providence to be near the Rhode Island factory. Another person who got a job from their dad. That was the way it was. In 1948, the Zionists declared the formation of the State of Israel in the midst of a civil war between Palestinians and Jews, then went on to defeat invading Arab armies and reach an armistice. In the process, more than 700,000 Palestinians were driven from Israeli territory by systematic force or threat, although American coverage of that exodus was patchy and often biased toward the Israeli narrative. My grandfather, likely unaware of the extent of the Palestinians' plight, held esteem for newborn Israel, as he put it, I identified with Israel, as I did with America, as a great liberating force. But it was largely for a pragmatic reason. No one else wanted the European Jews who had survived. There was absolutely nowhere for them to go, he later recalled. They couldn't stay in Europe, which was a graveyard, and I could see from my pre-war experiences that they were not going to be accepted in America or anywhere else. So at that point, it was a process of elimination. Grandpa was not a sentimental man, and the fact that Israel sat in part of the territory of ancient Judea held no interest for him. It was, he said, just the only place available for them. The UJA interviewer asked if his thinking about Israel had evolved since then. It hasn't evolved, it's crystallized, he replied, It can't be anywhere else, even if geographically it's an inconvenient place to be. In those early years of Israeli sovereignty, Grandpa held no particular affection for the country. As he put it to the interviewer, it was really like a relative that you had to support, whose company you didn't particularly enjoy, who gave you no excitement, no stimulation. Bob's first visit to Israel was a rough one. In 1961, he took on the annual bond-selling drive held by the Rhode Island Jewish Federation, then known as the General Jewish Committee, or GJC, for bolstering the Jewish community in Israel. After its conclusion, he wanted to see how the money was being used there. He was aghast at the country he found. I went there, and I was very disappointed, he said in the UJA oral history. In one sense, I had been led to believe in the pioneering spirit Not that I expected to see people sitting around the campfires, plowing with rifles on their backs and so on, but it was the most thoroughly bourgeois country I had ever visited. My God, this was the era of the so-called espresso generation, youngsters who believed Israel should abandon its rigid, austere, uh, millenarian ideology and become a normal place to live in the Western mold. Many of them believed Peace with the Arab world was just around the corner, an assumption my grandfather did not share. Sure enough, as the 60s wore on, Israel's dangers grew, as did Bob's concerns. It was around then that something strange happened to my grandfather. He fell in love. It was because Israel was threatened that it became precious, Bob told the UJA interviewer. When it wasn't threatened, it was an inconvenient relative. When it was threatened, it became something you liked. It's a pithy and revealing comment, and it summarizes the broader political and cultural shift that occurred within and around him. The rattling of sabers in the Middle East crested into a roar in the spring of 1967, leading Bob to firmly believe that millions of Jews now faced another existential threat. They were his family. How could he not throw himself into saving them? The June 2nd, 1967 edition of the Rhode Island Herald, the local Jewish newspaper, bore a full-page ad with a silhouette of Israel and imperative text, Let us show our strength and support in a, all caps now, total mobilization of our entire community. Interesting, by the way, that the local Jewish paper is called 
the Rhode Island Herald, not the Jewish Herald or the Jewish Daily or the Jewish Times or anything, just just the Herald. Anyway, there was to be an emergency meeting held by the GJC on June 8th at Providence's Sheraton Biltmore Ballroom. The future of the Jewish people is at stake, the ad read, and as every man, woman, and child in Israel stands ready to give his life, let us give the utmost. Give to the utmost. Okay. In a slightly bigger font was the name of the campaign chairman, Robert Reisman. Reisman? What what do we decide on on that one? Okay, well, by the time of the event, Israel had already launched a surprise attack, and the Six-Day War was well underway. Bob whipped the audience at the ballroom into a frenzy of patriotism for a country that was an ocean and a sea away, raising a vast sum. That mass meeting was the most fabulous thing, recalled a friend of my grandfather's who sat in on the UJA interview. Bob chimed in with one word, yes. That 1967 war, known to Palestinians as Al-Naqsa, the setback, turned out in Israel's favor. It also marked an abrupt and astounding shift in the history of American Jewry. For the first time, the Jewish community came close to being a community. A wide swath of people, from the Orthodox to the secular, Democrat to Republican, the well-off to the destitute, could agree on their love of Israel and fear for her safety. There were dissidents, yes, mostly among the ultra-Orthodox sects, who believed Jewish sovereignty should come only from divine intervention, as well as a handful of leftist groups, but they were comparatively few in number. There was a potent emotional combination at play. The pre-war terror that millions of Jewish lives might be snuffed out so soon after the Holocaust, coupled with the post-war euphoria that Jews were righteously powerful, that brew was intoxicating, and almost instantaneously, American Jewish pride in Israel became the order of the day. However, in one of the primary ironies of Zionist history, 1967 was also the moment when the seeds of destruction for the pro-Israel consensus were laid. The Israeli military occupied the Palestinian population centers, known, of course, as the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem, placing droves of people there under a martial law that was publicly depicted as temporary, yet became all too permanent. Against that backdrop, the Palestinian liberation movement burst into the popular imagination, following a series of high-profile plane hijackings and the rise to international prominence of Yasser Arafat. But the cause won few hearts in the Jewish community, least of all my grandfather's. Bob left the corporate world in 1968, at which point he devoted himself almost single-mindedly to advancing the broader world in what he saw as a liberal direction. He had co-chaired the Rhode Island division of John F. Kennedy's successful presidential campaign, and in 1968 he was one of the state's delegates to the disastrous Democratic National Convention. He was president of the Rhode Island Jewish Federation from 1974 to 77, he became one of U.S. Senator Claiborne Pell's closest advisors. He led boards. He received medals. He made money on investments. He gave to institutions, particularly Jewish ones, and in so doing, developed quite the platform for himself. When he spoke, people listened. And what he chose to speak most loudly about, in public and private, was Israel. I feel a strange kinship to my grandfather and our mutual commitment to yelling angrily about the media. I do it by complaining on Twitter, but he did it through his generation's equivalent, letters to the editor. He wrote them prolifically, and they were typically devoted to attacking a publication's recent article on Israel, declaring it ignorant of the facts and biased toward the Arabs, be they leaders of countries or stateless Palestinians. There were ample opportunities for him to do so, as Israel's government regularly committed war crimes, ranging from the settlement of militarily occupied territory to systematic acts of violence against Palestinians and beyond, making the country ever more of an international pariah. One of the few communities Israel could depend on for support was the Jews of America, and my grandfather's letters testified to the prevailing opinions of that community. Take, for example, this letter, published in the New York Times on June 28, 1981, headlined, Iraq has never sheathed sword against Israel. It took aim at an article about Israel's illegal, 
preemptive strike on an Iraqi nuclear site, the Osirak reactor, as I recall, which had claimed Iraq never sent organized units into frontline combat against Israel. So therefore, you would have no grievance against them, I suppose. But I mean, I don't know. To me, I guess having been immersed in it, a nuclear Iraq seemed like a bit of a stability problem and, a, and an existential problem for for Israel. Grandpa cited the Iraq's involvement in the 1948 and 1973 Arab-Israeli wars and went on to emphasize that the state of war between Iraq and Israel is not merely technical, as Mr. Smith characterized. Iraq is the sole frontline Arab country that has never accepted a ceasefire or armistice agreement with Israel. This was not just a fact check. Such comments in the Israel debate never are. It was an opportunity to use his considerable intellect to suggest that any statement that could be of use to Israel's enemies was woefully ill-informed about the nature of the threat and hadn't properly computed the moral calculus. Bob was, unlike many, under few illusions about Israel. He traveled there as many as three times a year as early as the 1970s and had a high-profile contacts there from parliamentarian Yigal Yadin to President Chaim Herzog. Grandpa was a military man and he knew where and how bodies were buried. The UJA interviewer mentioned that one of my grandfather's Jewish friends, Rhode Island Governor Frank Licht, is, have I pronounced that one correctly? Has recently, had recently returned from a visit to Israel depressed over its reactionary politics. My grandfather's response is remarkable. Frank had a dream, and he still has a dream, and he has a standard. What is happening is not in accordance with his dream, so to the degree to which it falls short, he is depressed. I, on the other hand, came from a tougher school than Frank, and one thing I know, and Orwell said it, though not in so many words, is that the latrines of the soldiers of freedom and democracy smell just as bad as the latrines of the soldiers of fascism. The food is just as bad, and the sergeants are just as bull. Israeli are, Israelis are human beings. They've got one effed up, he actually says it, political system. That's, uh, that's early for Grandpa. In this metaphor, Israel was the beacon of freedom and democracy, and the Arab world was akin to the Nazis, which is how my grandfather would go on to depict them in his speech just after my birth. That's the way leading American Jews characterized the conflict in the 1980s. Perhaps my grandfather had too much of a military mindset to even process, let alone be repulsed by the various atrocious actions committed by Israel's government and the institutional anti-Arab bigotry of its society. He was doing what needed to be done, regardless of any crimes committed in the name of defending what he saw as his community, his family. That is my half-hearted attempt to explain things like the August 19, 1982 issue of the Rhode Island Herald, in June of that year, Israel had invaded southern Lebanon and in the ensuing months killed upwards of 10,000 Arab civilians through bombing, shooting, and siege. There were, of course, complex triggering events that led to the invasion, but by August the consequences were undeniable. Much of Lebanon's south, including large portions of Beirut, had been reduced to rubble, and yet there was a photo of Grandpa on the cover of the paper beneath a headline reading, Federation officials return from Mideast. Lebanon is not in ruins. Bob and a group of other Jewish Federation officials had gone on a UJA propaganda trip to the country, which resulted in his coming back with a bizarre argument based on visiting parts of the country that hadn't been attacked. The point we are making is that the rest of Lebanon was hit very lightly, he told the Herald. They had made a stop at the city of Sidon and crowed that the destruction was limited to the obliteration of just two and a half city blocks. They left with the ardent right-wing prime minister, Menachem Begin, who oh, they met with, uh, who repeated his insistence that Israel has no interest in one square foot of Lebanon. It would go on to occupy the southern portion of Lebanon until 2000. Bob said all the Israelis he met were terribly upset by the raw deal their country was getting in the international media. The article included, uh, concluded on a grim, violent note. Reisman said he would have preferred military action to resolve the conflict and regrets Israel having halted its drive on Beirut. 
I've read and reread that article and wrestled with the question of gullibility. When my grandfather parroted the Israeli government's talking points there and elsewhere, did he ever suspect he was being played? I suppose it's possible that he, like many American Jews, truly believed that the Israelis wouldn't lie to him, that a man like Begin could be relied upon, that one couldn't trust mainstream media outlets and institutions for accurate information, but I fear the answer may be worse. He might have known full well that he was being served BS, let's say, and in turn was serving it to others and didn't care. He and the rest of the Jewish establishment in America had signed their pact. The first casualty of war, as they say, is truth. And if peace meant making Jews less safe, then war was the only option. To the very end, my grandfather was defending Israel. His final published work was a letter to the editor of the Providence Journal, printed on May 24, 2004, attacking an op-ed by a University of San Francisco professor who had criticized Israel and the U.S. for not coming to the negotiation table with the Palestinians. Where has the professor been for the last decade, Grandpa asked, then praised the Israelis for their efforts at peacemaking. A few weeks later, he broke his femur and died in the hospital at the age of 85. The senior U.S. senator from Rhode Island, Jack Reed, delivered the eulogy at his funeral. And the junior one, Lincoln Chafee, soon after read it into the congressional record. Bob's faith was more than just a theological exercise, Reed said. It was for him a summons, not just to reflection, but also to action. The conclusion of this article after this. Hi everybody, it's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time, just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad! Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction. And whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't do it without you hope you'll be on board soon too thanks for all your support all right welcome back now to the king on the morning show here on netroots radio we do want to finish this up it's an interesting and important one and there's a follow-up piece that i'd love to read but uh, we need about 15 hours to get through it so i'll just recommend it to you and then of course there's like ten thousand other things that we really need to get to but friday i don't know kind of a long read sort of a day even though it drives Scott up the wall when he has to summarize these things. But let me finish up this piece here. I think it's been informative and somewhat helpful and uh, just, to, I don't know, I guess helping to illustrate, if not settle, the contradictions in the minds of a slightly younger generation of than mine of Jewish Americans and what they see happening in the news and what they feel happening as between them and their families and maybe even Israeli cousins overseas, uh, but uh, important to have as a perspective. And then I can at least give you one thing that I took away from this other impossibly long article that I think is also valuable to hold in mind uh, a contradictory thought, or uh, I don't know, I guess, or at least another perspective, one that you uh, you don't have to be able to reconcile, you just need to be able to hear it and uh, turn it over in your mind. All right, so where were we with this one? Uh, Bob had just died and had been eulogized by the senators, the U.S. senators from Rhode Island. And then the conclusion, I so deeply wish I could talk to my grandfather about Israel, but I also dread the notion. 
I suspect it would be like the biblical conversation between God and Job. The eminently mortal Job questions the judgment of the Almighty and is given a stern talking to in return. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? God asks. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? My grandfather was undoubtedly a more educated and experienced man than I am or probably ever will be. I try to be confident that I'm morally wiser than he and his generation were when it comes to Palestinian liberation. But who am I to darken counsel by words without decades of knowledge? Where was I when Grandpa won World War II? I retain a sliver of hope that he could understand that I, like him, want to save the Jews. I have chosen to see them as my family, for better or for worse, and I believe that backing the status quo in Israel is not just a moral wrong, but a recipe for disaster. I am not alone in this. Israel's own politicians and security officials have long said the occupation makes Israel less safe. I believe Jews should have free access to the Holy Land and do not in any way want to see them driven into the sea or killed, but nor do I want to see Palestinians continue to be massacred and imprisoned. I don't think my grandfather wanted to hurt Palestinians, but their concerns didn't keep him up at night. For me, they do. They are part of my family, too, and until they are safe, the Jews will not be. Israel and Palestinians will not fix their problems without audacious solutions, solutions as audacious as, say, the creation of a Jewish state 70-odd years ago. I tell Bob's story not to litigate whether he was a good or a bad man. He is family, so I can't trust my own judgment to be objective. However, younger generations can learn from his grave mistake of not interrogating his own generational biases and assumptions. After all, Bob and his ilk thought they were humanitarians doing the Lord's work for the oppressed people of the earth. Let us be careful when we try to do the same. In 1975, Bob delivered a speech during his temple's services for the holiest day of the Jewish year, the solemn holiday of Yom Kippur, you know, the day I usually am not on the year. The topic was the biblical text Jews recite on that holiday, among several, a rotating cast, I might add, but the book of Jonah. In the text, God orders the titular prophet to tell the wicked people of Nineveh that they will be punished, a task Jonah initially rejects. After finally performing it, he leaves the city and sits under the shade of a gourd plant to watch the end of the Ninevites, but God spares them, enraging Jonah. God then kills the plant, endangering Jonah in the harsh sun, and asks Jonah whether he has pity for the dead flora. Jonah says yes. And should not I have pity on Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons? God asks. The book ends. If I thought about Jonah from one Yom Kippur to the next, it was with sympathy for the prophet, my grandfather said in his speech. I shared his frustration at God's eleventh hour reprieve of the Ninevites, but as Bob grew older, his opinion changed. Jonah's lack of compassion for the Ninevites was a failure of awareness, of imagination, he said. The death of the gourd affected his personal comfort and safety, but preoccupied with his own concerns, his own vanity, he could not visualize and had no feelings for the consequences to his fellow human beings in the city of Nineveh, any more than the bombardier of an aircraft, preoccupied with his bomb sight and release button, visualizes the consequences of his act on the human beings in and around his target. I wonder if Grandpa could see the irony of what he was saying, that he was literally describing what his beloved Israeli military does to human beings on a regular basis. Are we aware of the pain that our lack of awareness, our thoughtlessness, our preoccupation can cause to those around us, even to those closest to us, he asked. When we do become aware... Does our pride, our vanity, our selfishness, our fear of being rebuffed, concern for our presumed status or reputation stand between us and compassionate action, between us and our responsibilities? He went on, are we responsible? Are we compassionate? Or do we value the gourd above human beings? And then came the final line, 
I'll let it be mine as well, unsatisfying though it may be. The question hangs in the air like an unresolved chord, a chord that only each of us individually in his own heart, his or her own heart, can harmoniously resolve. And that does bring us to the end of that one. I thought an important contribution to the gathering of thoughts about the topic, let's say. Uh, the other piece I had on the subject, as I said, is enormously long, and it's in the uh, the London Review of Books, not someplace we normally turn for these things. But this, I thought, was particularly interesting. Uh, this current article, March 21st is the publication date for this version, this this volume of the London Review of Books. So that date hasn't occurred yet, March 21st, 2024. But the uh, the piece is titled The Shoah After Gaza. Shoah, of course, the uh, Hebrew word for for the Holocaust, the terminology used for describing the events of the Holocaust. And it's a difficult read, but one of the really inter- I mean, I guess I wish I should had highlighted this, and I guess now you can in pocket, but um, the takeaway from this, I guess I can read a little bit of it, but the takeaway from this, the, the author of the piece, the, the review here, uh, is Pankaj Mishra, uh, which, uh, you know, his tiny bio on the side here describes uh, Mishra's books include... Age of Anger, a history of the present from the ruins of empire, the intellectuals who remade Asia, and two novels, the more recent of which is Run and Hide. This piece was delivered as a London Review of Books winter lecture, which means you'd have to sit there for a long time to hear the whole thing. 7,503 words. It's a, it's a bit of a read. But my takeaway from this, if I can boil it down to just one thing was again Pankaj Mishra. He's basically reflecting on the, uh, or, or the takeaway I had was his reflection on the necessity of the establishment of Israel as many people view it, but view uh, that is to say as a place of refuge after the Holocaust. That was the that was the justification. Given Some people accepted it, some did not, but basically it was gained widespread acceptance. And it's still today uh, the underlying argument for the necessity of the existence of Israel. And by extension, it gets used to denounce uh, anti-Israeli sentiment. Uh, essentially, you know, it, well, you all know the trick that it becomes, it, it gets turned into anti-Semitism, regardless of where the criticism is coming from and its validity or where it's going. Uh, if you don't believe in the right of Israel to exist, then you are endorsing the Holocaust. That's basically what it comes down to. And people want to corner you and hang that around your neck if you have criticisms of specific policy outcomes and policy goals of an Israeli government, a particular Israeli government. You get why that's not workable, but there it is. Um, But what's interesting here is that he's pointing it out from a very different perspective of, uh, well, it's not all that different a perspective in in one sense of the word, but he's, how how is it that the, the Palestinian liberation movement in general has grown in acceptance around the world. I mean, their big problem, they're overcoming a tremendous PR problem of uh, dedication to terrorist tactics. And yes, that's ironic in the face of terrorist tactics having been used by Jewish partisans to establish Israel in the first place and to remove British, the, the, the British mandate, etc. cetera. Uh, understood. What he's saying, though, is uh, that it's a very Western view of things. And I guess to boil it down and maybe being slightly unfair to him in the way he puts it, uh, the rest of the colonized world, Pankaj Mishra has to say, uh, essentially says, yes, you're right, but welcome to the club, European Jews who faced 
not colonization per se, because Europe was already settled and colonized and divided and redivided, but oppression and extermination, yes, to a greater extent than everywhere else in the world. Perhaps, but maybe not. Essentially, they were saying the rest of the oppressed and colonized world has been holocausted many times in many places. And it's interesting that the extermination of a European-based minority finally results in a worldwide interest in whether, if not righting a wrong necessarily, then something close or akin to it and, and making amends for it by doing what? Well, by dispossessing yet another local population that doesn't matter to Europeans. That is an interesting way of looking at it and an interesting addition to the discourse on it. Uh, I don't even know if there's like a section that I can read to help illustrate that, but uh, probably <laughs> is the best I can say about that. Um, but how, how I can get to that part without laying the foundation of reading from this, I'm not sure. So let's indulge it for just a little bit here and begin with the way he tells the story. In 1977, a year before he killed himself, the Austrian writer, and I've got lots of names here that I'm going to mispronounce, the Austrian writer Jean Ameri, maybe, uh, A-M-E-R-Y, maybe you are familiar, I am not, came across press reports of the systematic torture of Arab prisoners in Israeli prisons, 1977. Arrested in Belgium in 1943 while distributing anti-Nazi pamphlets, Amari, uh, Amari, I'm, I'm not at all familiar, uh, himself had been brutally tortured by the Gestapo and then deported to Auschwitz. He managed to survive, but could never look at his torments as a thing of the past. He insisted that those who were tortured remain tortured and that their trauma is irrevocable. Like many survivors of Nazi death camps, Amari came to feel an existential connection to Israel in the 1960s, we just heard about it. Uh, not necessarily, you didn't have to have personally survived, but you see what the connection is. He obsessively attacked left-wing critics of the Jewish state as thoughtless and unscrupulous. and may have been one of the first to make the claim, habitually amplified now by Israel's leaders and supporters, that virulent anti-Semites disguise themselves as virtuous anti-imperialists anti and anti-Zionists. That is a charge that's often leveled. Yet, the admittedly sketchy reports of torture in Israeli, Israeli prisons prompted Amari to consider the limits of his solidarity with the Jewish state. In one of the last essays he published, he wrote, I urgently call on all Jews who want to be human beings to join me in the radical condemnation of systemic torture, systematic torture, where barbarism begins, even existential commitments must end. 1977. Amari was particularly disturbed by the apothe uh, apotheosis in 1977. A lot of things I'm not great with pronunciation of. Apotheosis in 1977 of Menachem Begin as Israel's prime minister. Begin, who had organized the 1946 bombing of the King David Hotel in Jerusalem. Yes, everyone was aware of that, but many forgot. On which 91 people were killed. That's terrorist activity was the first of the frank exponents of Jewish supremacism, as they put it, who continue to rule Israel. And it's hard to see how they don't believe in Jewish supremacism when you get right down to it. He was also the first routinely to invoke Hitler and the Holocaust and the Bible while assaulting Arabs and building settlements in the occupied territories. In its early years, the state of Israel had an ambivalent relationship with the Shoah and its victims, and that's important and not widely recognized and known, actually. Uh, not something that I was aware of until later in life. Uh, Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, saw Shoah survivors as human debris, 
that's in scare quotes there, claiming that they had survived only because they had been bad, harsh, egotistic. Huh. It was Ben-Gurion's rival, Begin, a demagogue from Poland, who turned the murder of six million Jews into an intense national preoccupation and a new basis for Israel's identity. The Israeli establishment began to produce and disseminate a very particular version of the Shoah that could be used to legitimize a militant and expansionist Zionism. Amari noted the new rhetoric and was categorical about its destructive consequences for Jews living outside Israel. That Begin, with the Torah in his arm and taking recourse to biblical promises, speaks openly of stealing Palestinian land alone would be reason enough, he wrote, for the Jews in the diaspora to review their relationship to Israel. Amere pleaded with Israel's leaders to acknowledge that your freedom can be achieved only with your Palestinian cousin, not against him. Five years later, insisting that Arabs were the new Nazis and Yasser Arafat the new Hitler, Begin assaulted Lebanon. By the time Ronald Reagan accused him of perpetrating a holocaust and ordered him to end it, the Israel Defense Forces had killed tens of thousands of Palestinians and Lebanese and obliterated large parts of Beirut. In his novel Kapo, 1993, the Serbian Jewish author Alexander Tishma captures the revulsion many survivors of the Shoah felt at the images coming out of Lebanon. Jews, his kinsmen, the sons and grandsons of his contemporaries, former inmates of the camps, stood in tank turrets, and drove flags waving through undefended settlements, through human flesh, ripping it apart with machine gun bullets, rounding up the survivors in camps fenced off with barbed wire. Primo Levi, who had known the horrors of Auschwitz at the same time as Ameri, and also felt an emotional affinity to the new Jewish state, quickly organized an open letter of protest and gave an interview in which he said that Israel is rapidly falling into total isolation. We must choke off the impulses toward emotional solidarity with Israel to reason coldly on the mistakes of Israel's current ruling class. Get rid of that ruling class. In several works of fiction and nonfiction, Levy had meditated not only on his time in the death camp and its anguished and insoluble legacy, but also on the ever-present threats to human decency and dignity. He was especially incensed by Begin's exploitation of the Shoah. Two years later, he argued that the center of gravity of the Jewish world must turn back, must move out of Israel and back into the diaspora. Misgivings of the kind expressed by Amory and Levy are condemned as grossly anti-Semitic today. It's worth remembering that many such re-examinations of Zionism and anxieties about the perception of Jews in the world were incited among survivors and witnesses of the Shoah by Israel's occupation of Palestinian territory and its manipulative new mythology. Yeshayahu Leibowitz, a theologian who won the Israel Prize in 1993, was already warning in 1969 against the Nazification of Israel. In 1980, the Israeli columnist Boaz Evron carefully described the stages of this moral corrosion, the tactic of conflating Palestinians with Nazis and shouting that another Shoah is imminent was, he feared, liberating ordinary Israelis from any moral restrictions since one who is in danger of annihilation sees himself exempted from any moral considerations which might restrict his efforts to save himself. Jews, Evron wrote, could end up treating non-Jews as subhuman and replicating racist Nazi attitudes. Evron urged caution, too, against Israel's then new and ardent supporters of in the Jewish-American population. We just heard about them in the last article. For them, he argued, championing Israel had become necessary because of the loss of any other focal point to their Jewish identity. Indeed, so great was their existential lack, according to Evron, that they did not wish Israel to become free of its mounting dependence on Jewish American support. They need to feel needed. They also need the Israeli hero as a social and emotional compensation in a society in which the Jew is not usually perceived as embodying the characteristics of the tough, manly fighter. Thus, the Israeli provides the American Jew with a double 
contradictory image, the virile Superman and the potential Holocaust victim, both of whose components are far from reality. But I see what he's saying, and I sense that as well. Uh, Zygmunt Bauman, the Polish-born Jewish philosopher and refugee from Nazism who spent three years in Israel in the 1970s before fleeing its mood of bellicose righteousness, despaired of what he saw as the privatization of the Shoah by Israel and its supporters. It has come to be remembered, he wrote in 1988, as a private experience of the Jews, as a matter between the Jews and their haters, even as the conditions that made it possible were appearing again around the world. Such survivors of the Shoah, who had been plunged from a serene belief in secular humanism into collective insanity, intuited that the violence they had survived, unprecedented in its magnitude, wasn't an aberration in an essentially sound modern civilization, nor could it be blamed entirely on a hoary prejudice against Jews. Technology and the rational division of labor had enabled ordinary people to contribute to the acts of mass extermination with a clear conscience, even with frisons, frisons of virtue, and preventative efforts against such impersonal and available modes of killing required more than vigilance against anti-Semitism. When I recently turned to my books to prepare this piece, our speaker says, I found I'd already underlined many of the passages I quote here. In my diary, there are lines copied from George Steiner. The nation-state bristling with arms is a bitter relic, an absurdity in the century of crowded men. And Abba Eban, it is about time that we stand on our own feet and not on those of the six million dead. Hmm. Most of these annotations date back to my first visit to Israel and its occupied territories when I was seeking to answer in my innocence two perplexing questions. How did Israel come to exercise such a terrible power of life and death over a population of refugees? And how can the Western political and journalistic mainstream ignore, even justify, its clearly sim systematic cruelties and injustices? I had grown up imbibing some of the reverential Zionism of my family of upper caste Hindu nationalists in India. Both Zionism and Hindu nationalism emerged in the late 19th century out of an experience of humiliation. Many of their ideologists longed to overcome what they perceived as the shameful lack of manhood among Jews and Hindus. And for Hindu nationalists in the 1970s, impotent detractors of the then-ruling pro-Palestinian Congress Party, uncompromising Zionists such as Begin, Ariel Sharon, and Yitzhak Shamir, seem to have won the race to muscular nationhood. The envy is now out of the closet. Hindu trolls constitute Benjamin Netanyahu's largest fan club in the world. Really? I remember I had a picture on my wall of Moshe Dayan, the IDF chief of staff and defense minister during the Six-Day War, and even long after my childish infatuation with crude strength faded, I did not cease to see Israel the way its leaders had from the 1960s begun to present the country as redemption for the victims of the Shoah and an unbreakable guarantee against its recurrence. I knew how little... The plight of Jews scapegoated during Germany's social and economic breakdown in the 1920s and 30s had registered in the conscience of Western European and American leaders that even Shoah survivors were met with a cold shoulder and in Eastern Europe with fresh pogroms. Though convinced of the justice of the Palestinian cause, I found it hard to resist the Zionist logic. The Jews cannot survive in non-Jewish lands and must have a state of their own. I even thought it was unjust that Israel alone, among all the countries in the world, needed to justify its right to exist. I wasn't naive enough to think that suffering ennobles or empowers the victims of a great atrocity to act in a morally superior way, that yesterday's victims are very likely to become today's victimizers is the lesson of organized violence in the former Yugoslavia, Sudan, Congo, Rwanda, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, and too many other places. I was still shocked by the dark meaning of Israel, the Israeli state had drawn from the Shoah and then institutionalized in a machinery of repression. The targeted killings of Palestinians, checkpoints, home demolitions, land thefts, arbitrary and indefinite detentions, and widespread torture in prisons seemed to proclaim a pitiless national ethos that humankind is divided into those who are strong and those who were weak, and so 
Those who have been or expect to be victims should preemptively crush their perceived enemies. Though I had read Edward Said, is that right? Said, S-A-I-D. I was still shocked to discover for myself how insidiously Israel's high-placed supporters in the West conceal the nihilistic survival of the strongest ideology reproduced by all Israeli regimes since Begin's. It is in their own interests to be concerned with the crimes of the occupiers, if not with the suffering of the dispossessed and dehumanized, but both have passed without much scrutiny in the respectable press of the Western world. Anyone calling attention to the spectacle of Washington's blind commitment to Israel is accused of anti-Semitism and ignoring the lessons of the Shoah, and a distorted consciousness of the Shoah ensures that wherever, whenever the victims of Israel unable to endure their misery any longer, rise up against their oppressors with predictable ferocity, they are denounced as Nazis, hell-bent on perpetrating another Shoah. Well, there's much more, of course. It was a half-hour lecture at that. Uh, so I'm glad we at least got to the point that he makes later on, which is, yeah, you know, for the rest of the world, in terms of uh, justification for the existence of Israel or its policies, uh, the idea that... Uh, European Jews in particular were uh, uh, singularly among oppressed minorities, oppressed worse than any others, or had uh, suffered worse losses than anyone else. Well, while arguable, uh, was not necessarily the case. No, no reliable numbers necessarily available for the numbers of deaths at the hands of colonial efforts around the world by the Europeans before. But, uh, yeah, not much in the way of a guarantee of existence of a national state of any kind for the rest of the peoples of the world who suffered and lost at the hands of European colonial powers. A very interesting observation alongside many of the others. And, and a good opportunity to remind people that, yes, for the first couple decades of Israel's existence, they had a very, very, very different relationship with the Holocaust and its survivors. And they weren't particularly gladly acknowledged. It was sort of a shameful element to Israel's background that they didn't openly acknowledge and that shifted entirely at some point after, I guess, the 67 war and then going forward. Very interesting to remember. And though it occupies a, a huge part of our day today, we really have to get back around next week to other things that are happening right here in our backyard. We haven't even had a chance yet. Uh, Justice has had a chance to mention, even cover at all, what's going on in Haiti. And I have so many articles sitting and waiting. Uh, Darwin, we beg you to come back as a senior correspondent and tell us what's going on from your perspective. In the moments now, uh, we have left we remind you From Justice Putnam Radio. comes up next com. you have been listening to Kegro in the morning with David Waldman so do stay tuned for the West Coast Cookbook and Speak Easy I don't know if Haiti is on the menu today but he certainly mentioned it there's also things going on down in Georgia decisions being made about what Fannie Willis can and can't do uh, how much of the case she can take on Eileen Cannon monkeying with what's going on there as well stay tuned and we'll see you next week and sum it all up again